So, um, Oscar, I, I think it's a, a good place to start with you because you're the CEO of DHL Supply Chain, which I believe is the largest um, logistics company in the world. So I thought it would be a good, a good start to have you give us kind of a macro overview of where our supply chains stand. I think we all in this room and outside the room experienced you know, the, the, I guess, fragility of supply chains during the worst of the pandemic. Uh, and it really revealed where some of the strains are um, in uncertain times. And then, of course, we're going through certain geopolitical issues which are also leading to reshoring and potential deglobalization. So from your perspective, where are we now today? Yeah, good. Yeah, and, and indeed, I think, I think four years ago, I still had to explain what a supply chain was. Right. I, I, th I think by now, everybody wants to know how the supply chain is doing. Exactly right. So that really, Did you ever think that, we would be at that point? No, exactly. No, I, did, I would not have imagined that. But, and, and indeed, so, so where, where, we, where we are now in supply chains, and I think, I, think I, I can build on some of the points that were made earlier before the, before the break, um, where you, um, well, one thing that is clearly happening is, um, uh, is what I call, uh, just to add a new term, is omnishoring. Only sourcing, sorry, only sourcing, meaning that um, uh, our customers, uh, our partners, um, uh, would not no longer uh, place their bets on one single source point for any critical um, part of their products, hmm. um, and that's effectively what you see happening. So that means that uh, whether you now call the China Plus or any of the other other uh, other names, it basically means um, it drives complexity of supply chains because it means that you have more sourcing points uh, to build the same thing and to uh, to move into the same supply chain. So that's one element that you see clearly happening. And yes, that also has to do with the geopolitical part. It has to do with all the unexpected things that might be, uh, that might be happening. So that's one, one element. Uh, the other element in supply chains, what you clearly see uh, is um, uh, the urge to more, um, uh, more digitalization of supply right. chains. Uh, and uh, whether that is the digitalization as in data and using data, as in using more AI, which we're going to talk about in a second, um, as in using more robotic solutions to also make sure that we have a, a physical flow which is, uh, which is more, more guaranteed. So that's an, an element which you clearly see. Another complicator, uh, because this is a simplification, but another complicator is obviously uh, the big trend on e-commerce. Um, e right. Where, where e-commerce, uh, we all feel, always think about B2C, but B2B is just as much there. There is no right. single company anymore that doesn't have an e-commerce channel, um, which has different requirements of a supply chain because an, an, uh, um, it has less uh, stock points in the supply chain and therefore it responds faster to, uh, to trends and to needs and to seasonalities. And it's another complicating factor of, uh, uh, of supply chains overall. And then the other big element, uh, which is obviously the sustainability right. um, element and how do we decarbonize supply chains, uh, which, is an, which is a big element, um, uh, which is not necessarily, it's, it's a bit contradicting with some of the points, but data and sustainability are very closely connected um, as well. And then um, uh, uh, it also then has uh, sort of looks at new areas, new geographical areas. Right. Um, so, for instance, um, one of the things that probably is relevant also for, for today's discussion, uh, we recently closed a, um, a joint venture with, uh, with Aramco to, um, to create a, an, an, an entity that um, optimizes uh, for the energy and uh, industry sector in the Middle East. Um, the supply chains using better data, uh, focusing on sustainability agenda, but also has a, um, a big element of uh, automation. Um, so uh, to really modernize that supply chain right from the start in, the, in a new strategic area. And, and we'll talk more about that in a second, but that will begin, you just signed letters of agreement, I believe, and, and have some regulatory approval that will begin when? So that will begin uh, beginning of next year, uh, once we have all the approvals done and all of that. Uh, and then that will be, be setting up and it, it has a first element of really modernizing the supply chain uh, in this case starting in, in, in Saudi Arabia but then from there it becomes a Middle East wide um, uh, uh, solution right. uh, we have similar type of business in Oman which was mentioned earlier uh, I've been there um, <laughs> uh, uh, so it, it has um, uh, so it is a Middle East wide uh, wide solution right. which will start from January onwards uh, Dr. Martinez you've been you've studied you know supply chains and um, we talked a little bit uh, in one of our phone calls earlier about what the pandemic really revealed. Give us your perspective on, on how supply chains have needed to adapt and will need to adapt. Well, um, 
<laughs> so that everyone is on the same page. Uh, what happened in the pandemic is that we all discovered that the majority of the ports were analog and therefore uh, they couldn't predict uh, how many e-commerce orders we were all placing at home, buying all kinds of things. <laughs> and that the analog world is really tough to manage when you have you know, oversupply because you have no idea which uh, ships are coming, if they're empty, if they're full of things. Uh, it, it was, that was the pandemonium. And um, where artificial intelligence is now creating inroads is uh, basically serving the big change in manufacturing. Right now, uh, manufacturers want to automatize uh, between 60 to 70% of anything that can be predicted and prescripted. It's a huge percentage. Um, and obviously, uh, they are uh, in need of anything that they do, build it with decarbonization strategies, which is how it is affecting the supply chain, it's affecting packaging, you have companies like Mondi, the largest uh, paper and pulp packager of the world, uh, now designing packaging with artificial intelligence to make it super effective. And you move along the chain and you get all the way to smart transport, smart ports, uh, the need to make them energy efficient. And artificial intelligence has superpowers and the biggest one is optimization. Anything that you can uh, predict, for example, needs of capital, uh, stock inventories, you transform warehouses from two-dimensional analog worlds into third-party fulfillment centers that receive packaging but never sits there gathering dust. You just ship it out, whether it's B2B or B2C. So this dynamism is really going to change the landscape of supply chain in the next five to 10 years. And this is where the opportunity is. The, the all uh, ports that traditionally have been handling the hubs are now going to allow the entrant of new parties right. that will start with a blank page of super tech. And that's the opportunity. That's particularly the opportunity, I think you would say, in the GCC in the wider Middle East, right? So. Yeah. Uh, Matteo, you're based in Riyadh yep. for McKinsey, so you work with a variety of clients uh, globally, I'm sure, and in the region. What what are you seeing um, as uh, the changes that are happening along this in these industries of supply chain and logistics in in the region? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mark, and then thanks for having me here. Um, there is a clear, I mean, there is a clear need of localization. Uh, if, if, you, if you take the agenda that the GCC country has, in particular in this case, and I'm based in Saudi, in, in Riyadh, there is, there is a need of regionalizing and localizing manufacturing. There is, there is a huge demand, if you think about the construction, the construction agenda that, that the GCC country has, they have billions of dollars going to be spent over the next whatever, five to 10 years. Uh, and the need of local manufacturing and local supply is very, very high, right, from material, from uh, equipment and including human capital labor. So there is a big need of creating a manufacturing hub in the region. That needs come with, with, with challenges, right? Because at the speed with, where they are going, right, it's very difficult for company, for private company to, to, to keep up. So for example, I mean, uh, take the example of, of industrial city that are currently created, Neom in, in yeah, Oxagon, right. right? Or you take, for example, the King Abdullah economic city close to Jeddah. Those become big cities, industrial city, which will have an integrated, almost supply chain, shipping and manufacturing at the very high standard, both in terms of digitalization, but also sustainable energy, right? They, have, they are designed by bringing sustainable energy from the beginning. So all of this agenda is creating a lot of pull from investor, right? Both private and, and also other companies that, that want to take part of that journey. That will also help them to almost leapfrog from a, from a, from a as a traditional uh, type of, of supply chain and manufacturing to something which, I mean, only with, with green feed you are, able, you are able to achieve. Right, right. I think that, that concept of leapfrogging is really important to think about because they don't, there are, you know, aren't a lot of legacy systems and infrastructure uh, and they can build, and, and these countries, you know, to varying degrees have a lot of cap capital to put to work as well as investors coming in. Um, Oscar, 
the example that you cited earlier, this new deal with Aramco, how does that fit in with what, what we're talking about here? Yeah, I think it, it very nicely builds on that point, eh, because um, um, uh, what we will be doing there um, uh, is create uh, the latest of the latest, um, uh, the, to share some detail, those will be five um, very large uh, logistics centers spread over spread over over the, over the area. It will be um, um, semi-automated with the latest uh, uh, automation types. Um, it will have uh, uh, optimized flows between them, so you actually reduce the uh, the emission. Um, uh, it will have indeed uh, from a data perspective, uh, we, because yes, we use data analytics and we use AI to optimize um, already today. But that uh, we will use the latest. Um, uh, to implement there because indeed you have the possibility that we basically build it from scratch so we can all uh, use all the latest um, technologies and innovations that we've had uh, into that into that um, specific business and it will um, uh, therefore help to uh, to leapfrog the the supply chain management in that in that region um, to then connect to all the various projects we're having and um, as you mentioned that there's a lot of capital available so we can move fast um, uh, there's a lot of eagerness and, and uh, uh, to will. get this done and will, will to uh, to get this done fast, right. and therefore we actually see that there's a lot of opportunity. And if you um, invest in in efficient uh, uh, supply chains, uh, link that to your point about uh, about efficient ports and, and, and data, then you can actually create a very competitive environment uh, to uh, to work in. So. This brings up for me the, the question of the human capital and the, the, the people necessary uh, to certain degrees. I mean, many of the countries import a lot of their labor um, supply. Um, we know many of the countries also have very young populations, so there's an opportunity there to bring them into, um, in, into this uh, network. Uh, Dr. Martinez, where, where does where do you see, you know, is there enough labor and how do they overcome some of those challenges? Um, well, um, in the DPA, we have a specific working track called the future of work and is how artificial intelligence is coming to automatize so much that eventually some low level jobs or tasks will be taken over by automated systems. The great opportunity uh, for me that that the region has is that it can be a test bed of what AI can do to make everything more agile without having to fire people, which is right. the big problem that uh, we have in the G7 and the G20, where yes, we want to put AI everywhere, but we have to take into account that you know there's tens of thousands of people carrying out these jobs and it has to be gradual. Whereas if you go to a country of the future, then not only you benefit from making tasks already taken over by machines, the population then takes over really purposeful tasks that are much more important, but also uh, the sooner you digitize everything, the sooner you start having historical data that will make your predictability and all the analytics you do much more infallible. Uh, because AI needs historical data right. and AI needs real world evidence data that comes from industrial IoT and blockchain. So I see a massive, massive jump in the next five years into the countries that, these have, that have this roadmap and they deploy it and then everybody trying to catch up. This is what we will see in five years alone. Uh, Matteo, when you talk to clients, um, how do they see the, not just the opportunities, but the risks? You know, what are the risks um, of, of, of you know, coming into the region uh, that you see or advise your clients about? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, for, for sure, for sure there, are, there are risks linked to the say, ability to I say, deliver at the pace which the country has set up. The I mean, pace? All, yes, the, pay, the pace of change is very, very fast. Right? And, and these require a, I would say, fully established ecosystem, which you cannot only say bring by, by having, for example, manufacturing facilities there, but all the supplier, all the shipping, all, all, all the ecosystem. So, so, so that requires a, a say, fairly, mature, fairly mature ecosystem, which enable a company to, be, to, to, to deliver on the manufacturing side, for example, on some of the projects. So what are some of the big risks? I mean, for sure, number one, as, as, we, as we mentioned, is human capital. We're short of people. We're short of people at, at, across different levels. High-skilled engineers, 
typically, and also the ones that are mostly blue collar that are, that are able to deliver the project. We, we've done a study with uh, around 10 million workers that need to be added from now until, until 2030. We need how many? 10 million. Uh, a year? Uh, uh, in, in total. In total, uh, That okay. need to be added to deliver on this, on this, on this giga project. Right. So that, that's one. Number two, it, it's around, it's, or as I was saying before, the, the entire, I say, green agenda, which, which links to the green material. For example, the, uh, green copper, green aluminum, green cement. Those are some of the focus that the country GDC in particular know and also Saudi are pushing to. But there is not enough green material available in the world. Right? Right. So how do you then build, I mean, that also ecosystem that enable I mean, you to, to deliver? So I would say human capital, I would say a bit more advanced green material, this is the one of the, the most biggest challenges. Oscar, the, on this question of ESG and, and sustainability for, uh, specifically, it, the, your deals with Aramco, obviously one of the lar world's largest um, petroleum uh, companies. Is there tension there as you talk about building a sustainable logistics um, hub there? Or how did they view it? No, I, th I think it, view it? there's not necessarily tension there. I, I, I think because they, uh, Aramco themselves, uh, wants to drive that agenda as well. Um, um, uh, because in the end, the, the energy transition needs to also be driven by, by those that actually sit on that side. Just right. as we are an, an, a transport company and a logistics company need to drive that agenda just as much. So, no, I don't think there is tension. I think there's more, it actually the opposite, rather the opposite, because there's ability, there's capability and, and capacity and capital to actually make those things happen um, uh, over time. So they really are viewed in tandem, right? I mean, the, yeah. the, that you build sustainability Absolutely. into the yeah. equation, yeah. right? Right. I know, uh, Dr. Martinez, you've been talking and thinking about this sustainability question as well. Um, and from what you're hearing, what's your perspective on, on where that stands in the region? Well, we already see that the top 10 most digitized ports in the world are building everything with decarbonization uh, strategies. Um, also because uh, the 17 principles of the UN are, are need to be implemented by everyone is at the top of the agenda. But also that allows you to be a lot more energy efficient. But in the big challenge of the world is not going to be that AI will take the jobs or the robots. It's uh, energy efficiency and the water access. Right. And, and, and that's why uh, the supply chain is going to completely transform itself in something that we will be amazed in the next five years. Is geopolitics, everything coming into place, whomever has built. This reminds me of when in 2010, Mark Anderson wrote, software is eating the world, meaning we all need to digitize our businesses. And some people didn't get it. <laughs> and those were the ones that pay the consequences five, seven years later. This is the moment to really uh, to transform the supply chain. Right. Uh, we have a, a question actually uh, for Oscar. With climate change, geopolitical conflict, should customers just expect to pay more for shipping going forward? If, if they don't optimize, yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> because that's the but point. But customers, you... the endpoint customers, or, or, well, I guess, because the, the companies I'm ordering from will then pass the cost along to me if they don't optimize? Yes. Is that so, what you're saying? So, 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 so the, point, the point I'm making is that, is that um, and I think it builds on your point, is, is if you wouldn't change anything in the supply chain and you would just add to that the whole um, uh, transition, uh, to, yes, of course, then there's a cost increase, and uh, let's not fool each other. I mean, uh, that, that actually passes on in the supply chain and ends up with the end customer. So that will be there. But if you optimize, um, uh, the further we optimize supply chains, and the further by, by using data, by using robotic solutions, by, by using alternative ways of, uh, um, of, um, of building up the supply chain, you can cover a part, a part of that. So the world you're describing sounds great. Um, but are we actually going to get there? I think I'll let Dr. Martinez answer that question. Uh, we, are, we are getting there. We are getting there. Um, and um, I, I know that uh, the minute uh, some of the ports, some of the companies have implemented parts of the supply chain, the optimization was uh, incredible and the cost cutting, of course. Um, what I see the momentum is in to then establish the roadmap very clear deliverables, plan for the next 18 months. In 18 months, whomever is on this roadmap will start capitalizing on the investment. Wow. 
Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, coming today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.